the First Amendment rights, the freedoms of speech, assembly, press, and religion, the right to equal protection under the law without discrimination, the right to due process, the right to privacy. Other specific rights that fall under these categories include sexual freedom, reproductive rights, freedom of belief, and freedom from unwarranted surveillance, searches, and seizures. These rights extend to all citizens, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, or beliefs. Though in times of fear and war, various presidents have arguably infringed upon these rights, the United States has a long history of honoring civil liberties. The American Civil Liberties Union has devoted itself to the defense and preservation of these individual rights and liberties since it was founded in 1920. In response to the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001, the United States government adopted rigorous counterterrorism measures. Some argue that several of these measures pose serious threats to the civil liberties of United States citizens. The ACLU fought these measures vehemently, both in the courts and through the legislative process. Since his inauguration in January, President Obama has made significant changes to the Bush administration's anti-terrorism policies. How far should his modifications go? How will the new administration balance upholding the security of the country with protecting the civil liberties of its citizens? We are fortunate tonight to have Nadine Strassen here to discuss current challenges to civil liberties, both those related to the war on terrorism as well as the many other challenges to civil liberties that face today's generation. Ms. Strassen, the first female president of the ACLU, held the office from 1991 until this past October. Currently a professor of law at New York Law School, she has written, lectured, and practiced extensively on constitutional law, civil liberties, and international human rights. Twice named one of America's 100 most influential lawyers, Ms. Strassen graduated from Harvard College in 1972 and from Harvard Law School in 1975. At this time, I'd like to ask you to turn off all cell phones and any other electronic devices. In addition, please hold any questions until the end of the presentation, when there will be a short question and answer session. Out of courtesy to those who may be hearing impaired, and because we are taping this event, please raise your hand and wait for a microphone to be brought to you before beginning your question. Thank you for your cooperation. And now, please join me in welcoming Nadine Strassen. Thank you so much, Ashley, and thank you all so much for coming out. Um, Ashley, I have a different uh, format in mind that Harry Pullman, my wonderful host and inviter, agreed to. I asked that this would be a conversation and a discussion about civil liberties, so really putting my money where my mouth is, so to speak, and believing in free speech. Oh my goodness, there are people over there too. Um, I really want to preserve as much time as possible for questions and answers and conversation. So uh, Harry uh, has volunteered to be my censor uh, and to cut me off at a maximum of a half hour. Uh, I just want to say, because you know the civil liberties agenda is so broad, I don't know how much uh, all of you know about the ACLU, but our mission is uh, the signature mission of defending all fundamental freedoms for all people. Uh, that is a very broad agenda substantively, everything from A to Z or abortion to zero tolerance, and they're all embattled. The ACLU was very, very busy, like 24-7, before the terrorist attacks on September 11th, and since then our work has essentially doubled. And uh, in the spirit of the Clark Forum, which I've read the mission statement, I know it's to stimulate critical thinking, discussion, and dialogue. I will respectfully disagree with Ashley uh, that the Obama administration has made a big difference on the uh, issues in the war on terror. Uh, there are some positive movements, but not nearly as many as we would have hoped. Before I get too far into the substance, uh, let me just start with the, uh, more than formalities because they're very much from the heart. I'm so happy to be here with my friend 
Harry and with the Clark Forum and at Carlisle. It's my uh, fourth time here. I've also been, um, in addition to being at Dickinson four times, I've been in Carlisle speaking at the Army War College several times, and I just have very positive memories, including some very evocative ones. Uh, the last time I had been formally scheduled to give the Morgan Lecture uh, was on what turned out to be a very auspicious date, nam namely September 12th, 2001. And I had been scheduled to speak here about not the War on Terror, because it hadn't been declared at the time that I was invited, but the War on Drugs. Remember that? That's one of those civil liberties issues that is still ongoing. And because of uh, all of the disruption of everything, including travel, after the terrorist attacks, that lecture was canceled. But uh, I did come back here on October 3rd, 2001, and that was my first public appearance after the terrorist attacks because uh, everything was canceled. You know, train travel was canceled, plane travel was canceled, uh, everything basically shut down. And I have very strong memories that that was my first opportunity to make public statements about what the relationship would be between national security and civil liberties, what the new challenges would be. And I was reflecting back on, on what I said then, and uh, I really feel as if nothing really has changed. Uh, not surprisingly, because the ACLU is always defending the same principles that we believe should always be applied to every factual situation. And uh, on September 11th itself, I happened to be in Washington, D.C. with a top group of ACLU leaders when uh, the, we watched the Twin Towers uh, come crashing down. And I literally remember when our then Washington office director came up with what the mantra has been ever since, namely safe and free. Uh, we knew from uh, every past uh, f period in American history when there was an actual threat to national security or even a, a perceived feared uh, threat to national security that many people would assume that there would have to be a sacrifice of civil liberties in order to promote national security, and yet history has shown that that is a false dichotomy. And I think, for better or worse, uh, that has been proven true. Just in today's New York Times, as I uh, was coming down here, I was reading a lot of commentary. Uh, many of you probably saw the Washington Post broke the story on Sunday about top national security officials, military and intelligence officials, uh, who attested to the fact that the torture that the United States has uh, undeniably engaged in, former Vice President uh, Cheney is now traveling around the country bragging about this, arguing that it has been effective, but you've got this whole cadre of top military intelligence and security officials saying uh, it was completely not only ineffective, but actually counterproductive because people being tortured uh, will talk, but they will say whatever they believe the torturer wants to hear. And in this de you know, demonstrated incident, somebody who was supposedly a top al-Qaeda um, uh, activist, turned out not to be, uh, gave out false information, false leads that led to a squandering of resources as our intelligence officials were pursuing dead ends. So that was just one of many examples I could give where policies that demonstrably undermine human rights violate civil liberties also undermines national security. And the same thing is true about the whole chain of human rights abuses that have made us a pariah around the world. The black, so-called black hole of Guantanamo, the so-called kangaroo court style military commissions, uh, the extraordinary rendition where our government officials are kidnapping people who are suspected terrorists and bringing them in secret to countries that our own State Department has denounced for engaging in torture. Top military leaders are saying that this 
undermines national security by becoming a tool for recruitment for, by al-Qaeda, by alienating our allies and driving them away from cooperating with us. So it's far from a zero-sum game. Uh, unfortunately, we are all demonstrably, going back to the ACLU mantra, mantra, we're all demonstrably less free now than we were back in 2001. And I'm not talking just about the accused enemy combatants at Guantanamo. I'm talking about every single one of us uh, who has much less privacy, who has much less freedom of speech as a result of the pervasive government surveillance uh, that has been instituted starting with the Patriot Act and continuing with the uh, National Security Agency, this so supposedly you know, super secret agency that's to engage in foreign spying, in fact, engaging in domestic spying and intercepting your email emails and your internet surfing and your telephone calls. Um, so um, now let me say, you know, the ACLU has always been staunchly nonpartisan. We never endorse or oppose any candidate, any official, any party for a number of reasons, but I think the most functional and practical one is that Every individual has a mixed record on civil liberties issues. Uh, there is no candidate, no party who has a perfect record, uh, either perfectly positive or perfectly negative. And therefore, the ACLU always criticizes each individual, each party, each organization on an issue by issue basis, giving praise on some issues and, and criticism on other issues. Uh, in fairness to our new president, uh, from a civil liberties perspective, uh, he has really been wonderful on a number of issues, and I always like to start with the positives. So uh, let me start with those um, on freedom of information. You know, transparency has been a big theme of this administration. It's a, somewhat of a mixed record on this issue as on others, but let me start on the positive on that issue. Freedom of information. Uh, the new Attorney General Eric Holder repealed a uh, re very restrictive order that the first Attorney General in the Bush administration, uh, John Ashcroft, remember him? Uh, John Ashcroft had uh, created a presumption of lack of openness of government information, said that his Justice Department, so-called, uh, would defend every withholding of information. Eric Holder has reversed that and said, you know what, we shouldn't even wait for a Freedom of Information Act request to be filed. We should just proactively and presumptively uh, post information online. Um, that, so that's very positive, although I'll give you um, some negative news on transparency in a moment. But let's stay with the positive for a while. Uh, the area of reproductive freedom and uh, women's health and health in general, the repeal of the international gag order that was denying funding to uh, pl family planning organizations that gave any information about abortion, the freeing up of money for stem cell research, the challenge to the last minute Bush administration regulation uh, that allowed the refusal of medical information and medical services, uh, even to women who were in emergency situations, let's say a rape victim uh, who couldn't get emergency contraception because the only pharmacist that was accessible to her had a religious objection. All of this is being overturned by the Obama administration, and that's very positive. Uh, there was enormous excitement on day two of the administration when the president issued a series of executive orders calling for the shutting down of Guantanamo within a year, uh, the suspension of the military commissions, and the ending of torture. Um, wonderful as that rhetoric was, it really has not been matched by the reality. And I say all of this in the spirit of we have to keep the pressure up, those of us who care about civil liberties. I think the, uh, there's an enormous amount of pressure coming from the naysayers and, you know, uh, poor President Obama, he's getting it from both sides, right? I read the uh, propaganda from uh, those who have a very different view on these issues who are saying, you know, this administration is soft on terrorism and they're going to release these Gitmo inmates 
uh, into our communities and, danger, and endanger all of us. So I know that other people think that he's gone too far uh, in this direction, but uh, the ACLU and other human rights groups are, are, are disappointed about, uh, for one thing, uh, the failure to make a commitment to not subject people who had been detained in Guantanamo to other forms of black hole detention. This administration has taken the position that the United States Constitution does not apply to the Bagram uh, Air Force Base in um, Afghanistan and, I mean, in Iraq and, no, I'm sorry, uh, in Afghanistan. And um, uh, uh, Harry gave me an article today from the AP that one of the judges in the District of Columbia uh, has ruled uh, that constitutional rights, including the habeas corpus right that the Supreme Court protected this summer uh, for inmates in Guantanamo does apply to at least some of the prisoners in Bagram, but that was over the objections of this administration. Uh, let me also say that the new Solicitor General of the United States as well as uh, Attorney General have taken the position that uh, we can continue to detain accused terrorists forever in preventive detention without bringing them for trial before the United States courts or courts martial. Again, not only human rights advocates, but judges and prosecutors have taken the position, why don't we trust our own criminal justice system? We have a more established track record of getting convictions with lifelong sentences in maximum security prisons for accused terrorists. Uh, and we have procedures in place, the Classified Information uh, Procedures Act, to protect actual pieces of evidence that would reveal national security secrets. Judges are perfectly capable of dealing with that information uh, in their own chambers without jeopardizing national security, giving fair trials to these individuals. Uh, the ACLU has been very disappointed because we have brought a number of cases uh, challenging torture, challenging extraordinary rendition, and the Bush administration had intervened asserting this very sweeping view of a narrow evidentiary privilege called the state secret privilege. It was a common law privilege, made great good sense, which said if you have a particular piece of evidence uh, that would reveal a state secret, Either that evidence can only be looked at by the judge in, in secret, in chambers it's called, without being shown to anybody else, or you proceed with your case as best you can without that particular piece of evidence. Well, the Bush administration converted that narrow evidentiary privilege into a sweeping immunity doctrine, making the claim that cases, whole cases, alleging torture, uh, uh, domestic spying on all of us, to give a couple examples of, of major abuses where they've said this entire case should be dismissed at the outset and our court system should have no jurisdiction over it at all. Uh, even cases that have been highly publicized, uh, one of our rendition cases was the subject of a par European Parliament uh, report, and it's been documented by the media all over this country and all over the world, uh, and yet the courts listened to the Bush administration exaggerated view of the state secret privilege. Everybody expected the Obama administration to change course. I mean, think about it. President Obama has outlawed torture and said that this is just not going to be tolerated. He has advocated transparency, uh, opposed an overbroad use of state secrets. So there was a lot of attention that was zeroed in on the appellate argument in this ACLU case. It was the first time, the first major post-9-11 case after the uh, change of administration. And with great anticipation, uh, all the media were gathered in San Francisco as our lawyer was making argument before the appellate court. And uh, the judge who was presiding over the argument says to the, admi uh, to the administration lawyer, the new administration lawyer, well, I assume that you're going to uh, withdraw your prior position and the government's prior position in this case. And the lawyer said no. And, and the judge literally, physically, I was looking at a videotape, physically did a double take. It, it, she was so shocked that the very same position was being pressed 
by this administration. Just last week, there was another incident. Uh, of this one I found even more surprising. Um, the Patriot Act contains a provision um, uh, that we describe as, in fact, the law itself describes as ideological exclusion. It's kind of an old Cold War concept that's been brought forward um, to the uh, post-9-11 era that the government may keep out of this country any individual whose ideas they believe are inconsistent uh, with United States national security interests. You know, no uh, effort to meet a very demanding First Amendment standard, just, you know, uh, ideas that would be uh, antithetical to United States government interests as defined by the State Department uh, with very little avenue for judicial review. Under that provision, many scholars and uh, religious spokespersons, philosophers, other experts have been kept out of this country. The ACLU is doing whatever we can. Uh, the most prominent case, I believe, is the one that was argued on appeal last week. Uh, it involves a, um, uh, a Muslim scholar, very respected, who's now been a professor, a tenured professor at Oxford University and now teaching in Switzerland, named Tariq Ramadan. He's very respected as a voice of moderation uh, among Islamic scholars who has spoken out very strongly against terrorism and yet is respected uh, through diverse swaths of the Muslim community, the Muslim academic community. He had actually been given a tenured position at Notre Dame University, which I don't think of as being in the business of tenuring terrorists. Uh, and under this provision of the Patriot Act, he was not allowed to come to this country. Um, so he, you know, after having given up his other position and gone to a great deal of uh, personal inconvenience, he, he basically gave up. Uh, the ACLU was doing what we could. Meanwhile, he was invited to give a lecture by the American Association of University Professors and some uh, religion and philosophical organization. He wasn't even allowed into this country to give a lecture. So we're talking about violating not only his First Amendment rights, but the First Amendment rights of all of the professors in this country, all of the religion scholars, everybody else who wanted to hear what he had to say. And the Bush administration kept him out under this provision. Uh, to my, I, I still am subject to, I should have been disillusioned at this point, but I was still shocked that uh, last week at the appellate argument in Boston, the Obama administration persisted. Uh, with the very same position that the Bush administration had taken on that issue, um, evoking a lot of criticism across the ideological spectrum. That regardless of, in fact, I read a piece um, just today by Christopher Hitchens, who's quite a conservative writer on these issues, and Hitchens completely disagrees with Ramadan. He says he's not a moderate. He thinks he is too, you know, not critical enough of terrorism. But so what? He says that is all the more reason to bring him into this country and to let us decide what his ideas are. Um, so, um, and I could give you other examples, but I, I say all of this not to depress you, but to energize you. Um, we do have an administration that clearly is very, very much attuned uh, to public, uh, to, to popular ideas, to what the people are saying. I think the positive executive orders that the president issued on day two were very much in response to an extremely concerted uh, a petition effort by masterminded by the ACLU, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and Human Rights First. And I think if we sustain the pressure, as all of our organizations are doing, if you're a member of any of them or uh, have signed up to be on our activist list, I speak from experience because I'm on those lists of all of those organizations. Every day we're sending petitions uh, to the president. To, I, I, one of the things that I very much like about him as an activist myself is his community organizing background and, um, he's, and, and his constitutional law professor background. It's a very good combination, uh, I must say. And as I was uh, telling Ashley today when, when she interviewed me, uh, I was so moved by the first words out of President Obama's mouth after he had uh, taken that oath of office that was uh, rather ineptly administered by the Chief Justice uh, of the United States, um, that his, after he has now 
accepted or been sworn into the highest office in the land and, and probably in the world, that his very first words were, my fellow citizens. And I took that as his saying, you know, we are all on a par as citizens, which, by the way, I take as not being literal because I think it extends to all persons in this country, citizens in the uh, broader sense of being members of this political community. And, uh, and I think that there, there really is a lot of work for all of us to do uh, through petitioning and, and lobbying in addition to the um, kinds of litigation that the ACLU is going to carry forward. Now, speaking of lobbying, I just want to give you one other example, and it will so illustrate um, not only that even with a relatively liberal uh, president who is good on some civil liberties issues that we still have our challenges, and also to illustrate uh, why we are nonpartisan in, in terms and, and non-ideological in terms of the organizations that we um, work together with. We will, co we will form coalitions on particular issues with any organization where we believe that that coalition will more effectively advance our civil liberties principles, even if we completely disagree with that organization on many other issues. And I think this has led to a great deal of effectiveness. Um, the issue that I'm talking about is lobbying. Some of you may have read that uh, as part of one of the new stimulus packages, um, the administration has imposed, the legislation with the administration's support, has imposed a gag rule on all registered lobbyists may not communicate orally, which means either by telephone or in person, with any executive official uh, seeking to uh, recommend the use of some of the stimulus funds for particular purposes. Now, registered lobbyists may sound, you know, like a demonized term, but it includes every lawyer and other advocate in the ACLU's Washington office uh, who is lobbying on behalf of civil liberties. It includes for every nonprofit public interest organization, everybody who is exercising that fundamental First Amendment right, not only of freedom of speech, but even more particularly, to petition the government for redress of grievances. And we have teamed up in opposing this gag rule with um, two very unlikely bedfellows. It's gotten a lot of media attention. Um, the, the big lobbying organization, the acronym is ALL, and these are the, you know, the special interest lobbyists for uh, corporations and what everybody loves to hate, insurance companies, banks, you name it. And then also kind of an anti-lobbying organization, an organization that specializes in criticizing that other group but says, hey, wait a minute, we also are registered lobbyists. We need to exercise our First Amendment rights uh, to press our points. And um, this is an issue where we're, as usual, trying to negotiate, but we may actually have to go to court over it. I, um, so those are just some of the issues um, uh, just within the last week or so. Um, I wanted to, in limited time, kind of give you a snapshot. And, and again, since our agenda is such a wide range of issues, I really welcome your questions, your comments, your criticisms, your lobbying, your petition, uh, whatever you want to do with your First Amendment rights on any of them. But I wanted to uh, just say a word about, um, to give you some examples of some of the issues that we've been dealing with on a state level. Um, because one of the things that uh, is essential about the ACLU's work is we are not only extremely active at the national level, I've mentioned Congress, the executive branch, the presidency, uh, also before the courts, I think the ACLU, although we're active in every forum, Many people tend to associate us with litigation, and we do appear, to give one example, we appear before the United States Supreme Court more often than any other entity other than the United States government itself, which is usually on the other side, and this year is no exception. We have a number of major Supreme Court cases upcoming. I guess I'll tell you about one of them, but then I also want to tell you about some of the work that we're doing here in Pennsylvania, which has local as well as national significance. Um, the, Supreme, the next Supreme Court case that we have upcoming 
um, is in an area that uh, I think is especially important for me to stress when I'm on a college campus. It involves a high school student, so it's a, it's a younger student than um, in college, but I'm very troubled about a trend that we've seen on the United States Supreme Court uh, to be more and more dismissive toward the rights of young people in general and students in particular. Uh, I find that extremely troubling and it, it, it's so out of sync with um, the gestalt of this era. One of the things I love about the Obama era is how engaged young people have been in politics and the political process and then to be treated by the courts as people uh, who don't have rights because of age or because of their student status I find to be extremely uh, distressing and counterproductive uh, to our democracy as well as to individual liberty. So this is a case that you may have read about. Uh, it's gotten a lot of publicity. It involved a student who was 13 years old at the time um, in middle school in Arizona who was subject to a suspicionless strip search in her school because she had been falsely accused by another student who had been suspected of having prescription drugs. We're talking about, you know, prescription strength ibuprofen, which I'm told is the same as two over-the-counter ibuprofen. So, you know, we're not talking heroin here. Uh, and this is the zero tolerance that I mentioned, you know, uh, when I said A to Z, zero tolerance toward any prescription drug. And uh, based on a false accusation by somebody else who had a motive to try to get herself off the hook. And the, and the allegation didn't even say that our client had the, uh, allegedly uh, had ibuprofen on her body. It was just that the student who was caught with the ibuprofen said she got it from our client and with no due process, with no opportunity for this student to explain herself no opportunity to call a parent or a teacher to advocate on her behalf. She was subject to a strip search. And the schools are basically taking, uh, the school is taking the position that she's a student, she's in school, we, she has no uh, what would normally be Fourth Amendment rights to be free from unwarranted searches and seizures, especially of such an invasive nature, uh, without probable cause, without some due process protection, without an opportunity to have an advocate on her behalf, and uh, you know the and 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 the damage that has been done not only to this student but to other students who are fearful that at any moment they themselves may be yanked in and forced to uh, bear uh, an adolescent girl to bear her breasts and, and genitalia in an invasive search by a hostile uh, school official is hardly conducive to positive educational experience. Uh, unfortunately, it's part of a larger trend of our schools becoming more and more uh, treated like more like prisons, you know, with police and what used to be disciplinary problems being treated as as criminal law problems. So that is going to be closely watched before the Supreme Court. I'm always very nervous, I must say, when we win in the lower courts as we did, and then the Supreme Court decides to review it. You know, at best, you could just hold the status quo. At worst, uh, you fear that it's going to be reversed. And now, shifting gear to some of our recent cases in Pennsylvania, there's, there's a, a common theme here. I'm sure you've been um, reading and, and seeing about these cases which have gotten nationwide publicity. Uh, it seems to me that every day, or almost, I'm opening my New York Times, listening to National Public Radio, my sources of news, and there's some new case from Pennsylvania. I don't mean to single you out. Believe me, it's true in every state. But since I knew I was coming here, I was paying special attention to, to Pennsylvania. Um, but, but actually, you know, they, I think this week's um, uh, cause celeb has been the so-called sexting cases. And I think two weeks ago, I think I confess I hadn't even heard of that word until I started reading about these cases. I'm sure you, you all know about um, prosecutors uh, who have charged 
uh, teenagers, young teenagers, with um, taking of each other what are called semi-nude photographs. I think that's even an exaggeration because sometimes the uh, girls are wearing bras and they're not even semi-nude. They're just not wearing, not, not fully uh, clothed with, with street clothes uh, and have been charged with either possession of child pornography if they have these images on their own cell phones, uh, with distribution of child pornography if they send them to their friends, their boyfriends, their girlfriends. And as you know, that is an extremely heinous crime, child pornography. It's something that makes you a sex offender, and then you have to be subject to the uh, very restrictive sex offender laws for uh, registration for the rest of your lives. Uh, in some states, these convictions have actually gone through. Uh, fortunately, here in Pennsylvania, thanks to uh, the active work of my wonderful colleagues in the ACLU of Pennsylvania, uh, we've been able to get a court injunction against these kinds of uh, prosecutions in at least some instances. Um, another um, set of cases that we've had in Pennsylvania that is typical of what we've seen around the country, but again, I think there's been more litigation here than there has been in some of the other states, also has to do with new technology and young people. And I think part of the issue here is there's probably a cultural shift between the young people who are using this technology and the old folks uh, who are the police and the prosecutors and the judges and the, and the jurors aren't necessarily uh, relating to these activities in the same way the kids themselves do. I, I was struck by reading that uh, studies that show that 20 percent of all teenagers had engaged in this sexting. You know, and yet you have prosecutors who are saying this is engaging in criminal child pornography, and the kids are saying no, this is, they call it flirting. So very, very different views of the same activity, and this is part of the reason why I'm so concerned about young people having power themselves rather than being subject to the worldviews and the applications of the laws of, uh, of prosecutors and, 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 and those who enforce the laws. Um, the other example um, has to do with the use of the internet and um, the use of social networking sites to create profiles, parody profiles, satires, critical commentary on school officials. I think about a month ago, uh, word came to light about the judges in this state who were uh, corrupt, who were getting uh, payoffs for sending kids to uh, a private juvenile detention facility. And at least in the New York Times story, the, the case that was the headline example of that uh, was a case of a student who was a very good student who got a very severe sentence uh, just because of one of these parody profiles of her principal. But what, so that case was dismissed along with the others that were uh, the result of this corrupt relationship between the two particular judges in the juvenile facility. But what did not get much publicity is that the, that factual scenario has been repeated in many other cases where there wasn't that factor of corruption, that legitimate judges were legitimately, I mean, I think incorrectly, but that was their view of the law, saying that the school should have power to punish a student for anything, a stu somebody who is a student, let me put it that way, because you're not a student 24 hours a day, right? You are a person who goes to school. And this, but the school's perspective is anything that you ever post online, even when you are not in school, even when you are at home on your own time, uh, that the school has jurisdiction over. And the schools want to exercise this jurisdiction for anything a young person says that is critical, even in a satirical fashion, even in an accurate fashion, of a school official. Uh, this violates core notions of freedom of speech, where you know we, the people, uh, have are the governors and have a responsibility, in addition to a right, to comment on government officials 
and principals in public schools are government officials. Look, I'm a teacher. My feelings are hurt if my students criticize me, but I still don't want them to be censored. Uh, and so we actually, one of these cases is now on appeal in the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, and it's a very important case. Um, the Pennsylvania School Boards Association has filed um, a friend of the court brief on, on the other side, um, asserting this very sweeping authority. And um, again, I think it's incredibly important for freedom of speech. Um, in, on the issue of freedom of speech and new technology, I always have wonderful associations with Pennsylvania because this is the state where the ACLU chose to bring our path-breaking challenges to the internet censorship laws uh, with which Congress greeted the advent of the internet in the in the early 90s and mid 90s. Uh, we chose to challenge the Communications Decency Act, which was the first federal cyber censorship law, quite frankly because we thought the federal courts in Philadelphia would be very receptive to protecting online free speech. They were. Uh, we succeeded, in, and it was very, you know, with 2020 hindsight, we can look back on it and say uh, it should be obvious, but it was very nerve-wracking. Television has a only limited protection under the First Amendment. Uh, that's something else that we're fighting in the Supreme Court right now. But the government was basically saying the internet should be treated like broadcasting. It should not get the same full-fledged protection that the pr traditional press does, that books get. And we were very nervous that the Supreme Court, uh, which is not known as being on the technological frontiers, you know, at least some of the justices don't even use typewriters, uh, let alone computers. And so it was really wonderful that the uh, first case to in which the Supreme Court decided how the Constitution would apply in cyberspace was a case that we started in Philadelphia uh, called Reno. Janet Reno was in the Attorney General versus ACLU, and I'm so proud that we won that 9-0, to zero. but no sooner did we do that than Congress went back to the drawing boards to pass another repressive law called COPA, the Child Online Protection Act, and you know, it's like the Patriot Act. It's no wonder almost nobody dares to vote against this. Can you imagine in soundbite politics, my opponent voted against the Patriot Act and against the Child Online Protection Act? But interestingly enough, uh, almost every single judge who heard our challenge, including conservative Republican judges, uh, saying, you know what, this law is so badly misnamed because it is as bad for children as it is for, free, as it is for adult freedom, uh, that children should be allowed to see material that discusses issues of sexuality, including uh, LGBT sexuality, including safer sex, including contraception, uh, not to mention all the art and literature that deal with sexual themes. That case was sort of like Jarndyce versus Jarndyce. Uh, it started in 1998 when the law was passed, and after being going up to and down to the Supreme Court twice, um, we won again in Philadelphia um, last year, and um, the government tried to go to the Supreme Court again, and within earlier this year, the Supreme Court said enough is enough. That's the end of the litigation, so uh, the government has never been able to enforce that law. I wanted to... What am I doing on time, Harry? I'm probably I just uh, one minute left or a little bit. Okay, I wanted to when I whenever I travel to another state, I always use the opportunity to go through press releases and the docket from uh, my colleagues in the ACLU in the other jurisdiction. And so, um, going through some of the press releases from the ACLU of uh, Pennsylvania, I just have to tell you some of the some of the headlines. Um, which I found rather, I, I wasn't sure, to me they, they sounded like headlines from The Onion. And I say this not at all to pick on your state, because I could do the same, I do the same thing in every state, but it's to emphasize that um, a basic reason why the ACLU was founded and why it's so important for every single one of you who cares about freedom to, uh, to speak up, you know, to know what your rights are, to notice when somebody isn't respecting your rights and to do something about it, including to call the ACLU. Uh, 
no right is self-executing, right? And uh, James Madison, who was the prime author of the Bill of Rights, said that he feared that it could be a mere parchment barrier against government abuse of rights because it's not self-enforcing. And that was why the ACLU was founded, the NAACP was founded, other human rights organizations founded uh, early in the 20th century to actually um, provide legal assistance to include, starting with information to people about what their, their rights were uh, and are. And um, here are some, you know, amazing issues that should never have arisen, and I really want to thank everybody in the state who has brought these issues to our attention, and my ACLU colleagues for doing something about that. But before I give you the current examples, I want to pay tribute to a wonderful lawyer who was, who died much too young, who was for many years the legal director of the ACLU of Pennsylvania. His name was Stefan Presser. And right when I became president of the ACLU, I spoke in Pennsylvania very shortly thereafter, and Stefan showed me, I went to his office, and he showed me a form letter that he had um, to deal with complaints. This was before the era of email, right? So it was a letter. And um, it had a blank for addressing to the relevant government official, whether it be the police department or the zoning board or the, you know, the public school board. And it would have a subject line for what the civil liberties violation was. And then the form letter would say, dear so-and-so, uh, please be advised that the above action uh, violates, and fill in the blank, the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, P.S., see attached copy of the First Amendment. <laughs> and, and that is so typical of the ACLU's work. Uh, such a high, you know, a lot of it is very high profile, controversial clients, path-breaking legal issues, the internet cases I've talked about were in that category. But the vast majority of it is simply enforcing long-established, long-accepted principles that are honored in the breach every day, often because of just good faith ignorance. The government officials don't know what the law provides. And with something as simple as explaining what the law is, you can make an enormous difference in not only the life of the individual who's directly affected, but everybody else who is then the beneficiary of that increased understanding and enforcement. So. Um, here, oh, when I was going through the press releases from Pennsylvania, um, here is my favorite recent one. And again, I thought that these were like headlines from The Onion, but not. Um, City of Scranton settles with woman improperly charged for swearing at toilet. Um, so here's a woman in Scranton whose toilet was overflowing and Understandably, she got upset and she was swearing at it, but it was next to an open window. Uh, and a city police officer who was her next door neighbor, an off-duty police officer, overheard her cursing at the toilet through an open window, uh, called his on-duty counterpart part to report her. Uh, a single mother of four faced 90 days in jail and a $300 fine. Uh, but to add insult to injury, before he reported her, he shouted at her to shut the fuck up, <laughs> close quote. <laughs> um, I, here's, here's another example. Um, ACLU appeals conviction of Bridgeville man charged with harassment for contacting his public officials for help. Uh, and it turns out that there was a law, this is an amazing law, there was a statute that prohibits, quote, engaging in a course of conduct that serves no legitimate purpose, close quote. I think all of us would have to plead guilty to that at some point in our lives. But this was somebody who was really trying to complain about some environmental hazard in his, in his uh, jurisdiction, and they were getting angry uh, because they said that um, he was contacting the wrong official. They weren't giving them the name of the uh, correct 
elect official. Um, I, I'm, one example was um, in the New York Times recently, um, and I, uh, one thing that was surprising about it, I, I confess, I had not realized that we still have blasphemy laws in a few states. Um, and what was really amazing, this law was about Pennsylvania. Uh, most the other states, the blasphemy laws are all relics of the 18th century. Um, this law was adopted in 1977. Did you know that? I know for the students here, that still seems like ancient history. Uh, to some of us, it doesn't. And interestingly enough, it was a Democratic legislator. Again, see, no stereotypes about party affiliations, um, uh, who wrote the bill after. And, and it applies only to corporate names. You can't have a corporate name that is deemed to be insulting to uh, Christianity or monotheism. And uh, the bill was written after a mail order firearms dealer filed in corporation papers for the goddamn gun shop. Well, I guess it would be a Democrat that would go after that. Um, so the ACLU is challenging that law. And um, let me just um, close my list of examples with this one. ACLU of Pennsylvania announces settlement for man arrested for videotaping police officers in public. Um, and, 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 you know, here again we have the, and by the way, you see the word settlement or hear the word settlement. That shows, the, it demonstrates the point that I was making, that the law is very clearly in favor of our clients. But so what? They would still be thrown into jail, fined, subject to all of the other penalties uh, were it not for their fortitude in standing up for their rights. We couldn't do anything without these courageous clients. So I start by saluting them uh, and then my ACLU colleagues for helping them to enforce their rights. Um, but these are not, you know, these are not path-breaking legal issues, but they really make a difference um, in everybody's lives. I thought this was very interesting because um, it was um, Richard Hookway, a Spring City resident, arrested for, uh, cited for videotaping on-duty police officers in public. That sounds like a very heinous crime, doesn't it? Um, he was, he, he wanted to, he was concerned that the police officers were spending time outside of their jurisdictions and running personal errands while on duty and in uniform. So he began recording them and they began retaliating against him when they saw him photographing them engaging in improper activities. Uh, he was charged with crimes, uh, stopped and questioned uh, many times, and um, threatened with, 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 with jail. Um, but I love what he said after the settlement. He said, they were unfortunate incidents after he had been repeatedly harassed. Uh, they were unfortunate incidents, but I felt I had to stand up for my rights as everyone should, but not enough people do, said Hookway. Quote, police need to know that they also have to follow the law and that we are citizens, not subjects. I just thought that was so wonderful, so I'd really like to salute him and everybody else. And I think I'm going to terminate my opening remarks. I'm sure I'm at the half hour mark. I don't have a very, you're not a good censor. And I think that's a compliment. Uh, but just, you know, in the spirit of uh, Richard Hookway and the other wonderful clients um, and protesters and defenders of, of their rights um, that I've mentioned, I just want to say that uh, activism, and here I do salute President Obama for that spirit of uh, community organizing and empowerment and activism uh, that I hope we will enable him to uh, live up to on every civil liberties issue. Um, one of my favorite quotes on, on this subject is from Alice Walker, the great African-American poet and activist who said, activism is the rent I pay for living on this planet. Thank you very much. I welcome your questions. Okay. Just a quick announcement. Um, if anyone's having trouble hearing um, in the side room, you can come into this room and sit on the floor in the front. Um, now, any questions anyone has? Um, questions, comments, as I said, criticisms. And Harry, I'd like one hour. <laughs> <laughs> I 
You know, I'm a law professor, so if you don't raise your hand, I'm going to call on you. <laughs> that always gets a hand up. <laughs> Hi. I teach down the road at the local community college oh. where last year the administration suddenly tried to put in what they called a free speech area or oh. free speech zone. And a few of the senior professors who had been through similar things from back in the day, uh, we contacted the ACLU. We had to go outside even our faculty organization. And I don't know if Dickinson has a problem with this or not. I, I hope not. But um, it was very good that we had the ACLU oh. so that we could go to them and get an opinion. And mm -hmm. it's funny how the college solicitor really didn't start paying attention to the faculty until we contacted the ACLU. <laughs> So thank you for that. Well, you're very welcome, but thank you. Um, and, and did we win? Did we get justice? 90%. Okay. I mean, that's such an oxymoron, right? A free speech zone. That's what this whole world should be, right? And, and, and um, I find it very sad that um, academic institutions where freedom should be most flourishing, um, it's, it's often embattled. I can't believe they're, well, should I talk some more? You know, like, how about intelligent design? That's another case from Pennsylvania. Yeah. Cotton, right? Thank you. Is this on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for your talk. I wonder if um, a lot of the Obama administration's retention of these Bush era policies might be considered a result of sort of uh, executive power creep. Yes. And that the Obama administration wants these in place for in a sort of instrumental way to push through some of the things that it wants to do. Maybe you could just speak, speak yeah. to that a little bit. Uh, there was, um, there's a, a writer, a national security writer for uh, the New York Times whose last name is Savage, and I'm blanking out on his first name now, who, who wrote an entire book about this, and I heard him interviewed recently. Um, and he had a historical perspective where he showed, you anticipated all these questions, Ashley, so you get to hear them twice, um, where uh, he shows that historically, even people who, when they were candidates for president, were criticizing the incumbent for abusing or uh, aggrandizing executive power, that once they got elected, retained, deliberately retained the same power. And his thesis, and it, I'm not a historian, but to me it makes sense from human nature, um, or at least the nature of people who want to be president of the United States, that it's a one-way ratchet that it never trims back. And um, I, as I was saying, Ashley summarized it very well, for me this really comes down to checks and balances. Okay, so maybe we should have a strong executive whose responsibility and role is to exercise executive power to the max for the purpose of protecting national security, public safety, the common defense, and so forth. If, but only if, and at the very least, that you have equally vigorous checks from the other branches of government, an independent judiciary that is really strictly scrutinizing what the executive branch is doing, strongly enforcing the Constitution, demanding evidence, not deferring to executive authority, and if, but only if, you have vigorous oversight by Congress, and I think both of the other two branches really have not been pulling their weight uh, as effective counterweights to the president. So that to me is a very bad combination. In fairness, somewhat surprisingly, this Supreme Court has imposed more of a check on the president certainly than we've seen in past eras. Uh, infamous example being the Korematsu case and other decisions by uh, the Supreme Court that, during World War II that didn't demand any evidence at all of the alleged justification for the anti-Japanese uh, American measures. This court, when it has heard cases uh, arising from the war on terror, has consistently rejected 
claims of presidential authority, which is very much a step forward. Uh, the disappointment, which doesn't get as much public attention, are the many post-9-11 cases that this court has just ducked altogether, decided not to review. And you better believe me, the ACLU and our uh, allies in the human rights movement don't go to the Supreme Court asking it to hear a case unless we think on the merits we have a, a very good shot at winning, but many of those cases, including uh, cases about whistleblowers' rights, cases about domestic spying, uh, challenges to gag orders and surveillance under the Patriot Act, um, challenges to the state secret uh, uh, privilege, challenges to extraordinary rendition, torture, these are all issues where the Supreme Court has refused to rule on the merits in effect giving a victory to uh, the administration's excessive uh, exercises of power. And as far as Congress is concerned, uh, I thought it was said best by William Sapphire when he was still writing for the New York Times. Now here's somebody who came out of the Nixon administration which gave us the term the imperial presidency, hardly a shrinking violet when it comes to presidential power. Um, Sapphire first of all referred to some of the uh, actions by the Bush administration as uh, dictatorship. He used that word. It was a hyperbole that the ACLU never used. Dic dictatorial power, he said, and he described what Congress was doing as undersight. <laughs> Not oversight, but undersight. And, and there, I'm really disappointed. I mean, we haven't seen, one, and one of the points I didn't mention is accountability. Uh, for past abuses by uh, the Bush administration. We now have the ICRC, the International Commission of the Red Cross, as well as top military officials and, and other officials saying that torture, we did engage in torture, and they're using the T word, and it did violate our international obligations, and it does constitute a war crime, and it does violate domestic statutes, and, uh, you know, and it's leading to, possibly to prosecutions for war crimes in other countries, and yet uh, we don't have anything going on in this country, either in terms of congressional commissions and investigations, or in terms of what we've been calling for from the administration is the appointment of an independent counsel. Um, so it's clearly, if you don't even have that kind of accountability for past abuses, there's no disincentive to a future administration to exercise that power and abuse that power. Hi. I see the, oh, you, your hand, sorry. I, the gentleman in the brown shirt. Oh, is there somebody back there? Oh, sorry. If we could go back to the, the sexting yeah. issue for a moment. Where does that, where does it stop? If somebody takes a picture of, of herself, himself, 15-year-old, puts it on his or her cell phone, maybe sends it to a friend, okay, then the friend sends it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And then it goes somewhere else, and then soon it's, you know, in this, in one of the cases that you were referring to in the New York Times, uh, you know, I think the, the fear of the school officials was that it was, um, you know, going around to a, a, a whole range of people in the school uh, where they're not supposed to have cell phones, perhaps, or not use them in school, but, you know, the kids do. And um, so at what point does it become either innocent or self-expression. I, I take a picture of myself or my friend takes a picture of me. Uh, and then when it gets, you know, things can spread so quickly, is there a point at which it does become abuse? How has the ACLU, you know, it's new, we haven't heard about it until two weeks ago, as you mm -hmm. said, but uh, uh, what would the ACLU do? At what point would it become or might it become an invasion of privacy rather than free expression or or something more than just innocent fun? Well, I, I can speak for myself, not for the ACLU in general, uh, although I'm certainly familiar with ACLU policies. I was told that one of our lawyers from the Harrisburg office might be here tonight, and if that's... Hi, and what's your name? Val. Uh, Val? Yes. So if you want to deal with that, that would be wonderful, and then I'll give you my comment on it. And, to, and, and introduce yourself and tell us your title. Okay, um, my name is Val Birch and I'm a staff attorney in the Harrisburg office. Um, I am one of the lawyers on the sexting case. Uh, we've worked <laughs> tirelessly in the last few weeks to get it filed. 
Um, I think that there are a couple distinctions we need to make here. One is when you talk about privacy issues, if I take a picture of myself, there's no invasion of privacy. I did it myself. And that's an important distinction. When you talk about what the school officials have access to, school officials may be able to confiscate a cell phone if a student has it in school turned on when they aren't supposed to. But the search of the contents of the cell phone is a whole other step that we don't think they can go beyond. We don't think that there's any reason a teacher ought to be able to search a cell phone. The teacher can take it, turn it off, and hold it until the student is leaving the school. Um, but I think it's an unauthorized search. Um, so we really have to break it down into the search and seizure question in schools, the question about privacy rights, and you also have to consider who took the picture and who distributed the picture. Those are different actors sometimes. Sometimes it's the same person. Um, in this case, none of those issues are at play except for the school's actions, which I do think were illegal because they did search the cell phones of the students involved. And there were about 100 cell phones searched. That's a massive search. The Scranton one that we're litigating. Yes, and I heard about that. These are popping up everywhere. Um, but if yeah. anybody has problems with sexting, uh, give me a call. <laughs> we'd, like to, <laughs> we'd like to help you out. Oh, it's so nice to meet you. Thank you so much for your wonderful work. On, on the broader question, I would say, you know, even if one can imagine a situation, well, let me start with this. I think every comment I've read from my colleagues in the press um, has been, not to defend the wisdom of what the students are doing. I mean, I agree that it's their freedom of choice and they're waiving their privacy by um, taking this picture. I think that you have to understand the risk with this technology uh, that everything you post and, and send to a friend might go around the world, right? Um, and that's an educate if students don't realize that or young or adults don't realize that for that matter, right? How many situations have we read about where people say things on email and they have this illusion that uh, it's only going to stay between them and the person to whom they send the email and lo and behold, it's it's out there in cyberspace and it can't be reined in. Um, so it you know it's a it may be an ex poor exercise of judgment, but whatever it is, it certainly is not the crime of of creating and distributing child pornography. Child pornography has a very specific. Uh, is a very specific concept, which is that um, a child is being exploited for purposes of providing sexual titillation uh, to the recipient, which is usually an adult. Uh, and whatever that, whatever negative you can say about what the kids are doing in this situation, it certainly does not constitute that harm of child pornography or exploitation of that child. Now, at some point, conceivably it could, if a particular adult took the image and distributed it for that kind of purpose. Um, so, you know, down the chain. But you could not blame the child himself or herself. There actually have been some convictions I saw in Florida where, you know, to add insult to injury, some girls had had sent their pictures, semi-undressed pictures, uh, to boys, not even their own boyfriends, but to boys, and then the boys were prosecuted and convicted as being uh, child pornographers. And they hadn't even voluntarily gotten the, the material. So the, I think there are issues that all of us as educators and parents um, and friends of, of young people as users of cell phones ourselves have to educate ourselves about. But this is one of many issues where the criminal law, I think, is not the appropriate tool at this point. Hi. Uh, somebody else is controlling the mic, sorry. That's fine with me, because my eyesight is so bad I'm only seeing people up front. <laughs> Hi. Um, I think that most people would agree that like a sort of a big brother kind of state where the government watches everything isn't an ideal state. But speaking to that government surveillance, if I'm not doing anything wrong, why should I necessarily even care that the government is watching me? 
I think that's a wonderful question, and I, I can somebody else in the audience answer that? This is the law professor in me coming out. Does anybody want to answer that? Do you disagree with that? If you're not doing something wrong, you shouldn't care about government surveillance. Everybody agrees with that, or too shy to answer? Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, and but you know, just to functionally, if I'm there's nothing wrong with writing a love letter to my husband, right? There's nothing wrong with uh, reading a particular book or magazine. There's nothing wrong with belonging to a particular organization. Uh, there's nothing wrong with describing a personal psychological issue with one of my friends, her psychological issue, not mine. You know, I'm being facetious there. I don't want the government to be surveilling any of those communications, not because they're wrong, but because they're private. So I'm just giving some specific examples of it doesn't have to be criminal activity. In fact, it can be the opposite. It can be, and I don't think it's any of the government's business what my political beliefs are, what my religious beliefs are, who my friends are, what books I read, um, you know, the intimate way that I would communicate with, with friends and associates. So, so that's what I have to hide. And you know, it's interesting because you say Big Brother, and I'm so happy you know that reference. I've been told on college campuses that I shouldn't use that phrase because I can't assume that students will have read George Orwell in 1984. I, I do reread that book every year, and it's, I, it's sad how much it stands the test of time. But I think what's really important, and if you haven't read it in a while, I urge you to reread it, how much life is diminished, not only liberty, but life and human relationships is diminished, not by any heavy-handed, uh, you know, oppressive tactics. The government isn't necessarily engaging in torture and rendition. All it is doing is watching. And it's so interesting to see the diminution of individual liberty that people, I use the example of writing a love letter to my husband deliberately because what you see in that kind of omnipresent surveillance is that it's impossible for truly intimate relationships to flourish. And I'm not just talking about sexual intimacy, even having a, a conversation in which you bear your soul to somebody else becomes impossible and it becomes so dehumanizing. And I think one of the things that's wonderful about that book is that it really takes this abstract concept of how our lives can be impoverished um, and, and you know, gets away from the abstract concept of privacy and you can really imagine the impact it has uh, on, 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 on even, especially innocent people. personally believe that the closing of Guantanamo Bay was a huge mistake because uh, in CNN, uh, I think during spring break, I saw this video that already 40 of the prisoners released from Guantanamo Bay, they have already returned to their so-called jihad and the recent killings in Afghanistan is now uh, pre-planned by some guy who was locked up in Guantanamo Bay. I'm not telling that innocent people were not locked up. There are, I think, one or two innocent people locked up. But the thing is that torturing is bad, but locking up them and torturing is different. So I think that the CNN video focused on that very dangerous people are locked up there. And Dick Cheney already said that the Obama's, uh, President Obama's things going to make U.S. more vulnerable and there might be more attacks on the United States. So yeah. what are your comments yeah, on that? Yeah, there's absolutely no doubt that that's what the assertion is. Of course, that's, they're saying that all of us are going to be subject to more terrorist attacks if we change any of the Bush administration policies. And yet the fact is that uh, B Bush administration's uh, edict was that all of these, I think it was up to 600 at some point, that all of them are the worst of the worst, they're the most dangerous, and the Bush administration itself released many, many uh, prisoners at Guantanamo because they simply didn't, not only did they not have any evidence that they were enemy combatants, but they had evidence that they were not. And we're not talking about one or two. We're talking about many, many dozens. And the, the allegations that these people have returned to the battlefield have been absolutely decimated by serious analysis. And let me tell you, Antonin Scalia on the Supreme Court, um, in his dissenting opinion in the 
I guess it was the Boumedian case, um, uh, had quoted some study that had come from um, some department in the Bush administration that cited that, I think it was the same number that you were talking about, 40 people. And then it was re retracted. That allegation was retracted by the very agency that had made it and said that it was completely inaccurate and uh, there was no basis for making that assertion at all. Now, um, the reason the Obama administration is waiting to close down Guantanamo is precisely because it's making individualized determinations, as the Bush administration had been doing, about every individual and whether that there actually is evidence that this person committed a cr terrorist crime, in which case that person should be prosecuted, right? If we have criminal evidence against somebody, we have the tools available to prosecute that person either in our federal courts or in, United, in courts martials, the same system that's used for uh, members of our own military or, or other military. And why do we lack confidence in our judicial system to bring to justice those with respect to whom we have evidence? Unfortunately, we have some situations now where uh, the government itself, including in the Bush administration, is saying we don't have evidence because we engaged in torture. And so the information that we got is not going to be admissible in court. And that's another perfect example of where the torture was multiply counterproductive because it makes it, 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 it immunizes them from effective prosecution. But nobody is saying that if you really have evidence that somebody is going to be in danger and you know, return to the battlefield or has committed a crime in the past, that that person uh, should just be released. more question. Oh, but how many more answers? Mm. <laughs> uh, this goes back to uh, the Reagan era. I remember it well. Mm -hmm. And now I feel like saying the good old days, which is really <laughs> pathetic. <laughs> the, uh, in California, the, the move to uh, release people from mental institutions mm. and the ACLU was quite active. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what you, how you view that. I can't, can't, did you say California? Because I'm, fam oh, I'm familiar, I'm familiar with what happened in New York, and so I can't comment nationwide, but um, I had moved to New York at that point, and the New York Civil Liberties Union brought a very, uh, famous landmark case against a facility called the Willowbrook Institution uh, where mentally ill people or allegedly mentally ill and mentally retarded people uh, had been warehoused in these facilities where they weren't getting any treatment at all. And as part of a nationwide movement, um, th where the NYCLU actually, I think, did spearhead a movement. And it's actually, there are now spin off organizations, including the David Bazelon Center uh, in Washington, was a spin off from the ACLU of saying that the government ha cannot simply lock people up uh, alleging they're mentally ill without giving them some kind of treatment uh, and p also putting them in uh, the context concept was the least restrictive kind of environment, including community-based mental health centers. Now, what happened in New York when uh, the NYCLU won this lawsuit again, I mean, the facility was horrible. I mean, people were, it wasn't only that they were locked up, they were just, you know, not given any sanitation. They were in the most degrading kinds of uh, situations. I remember, you know, people just lying in their own feces and, and, and not getting food and not getting sanitation. Um, and so uh, a judge ordered that they would be released to community-based facilities. And then as time went by to less and less restrictive facilities, and as I understand it, it was the state that defaulted on its part of the obligation. And rather than these people going to community facilities, too many of them were just dumped onto the street um, uh, where they became part of the growing homeless population. That led in the Giuliani administration, no, actually started under uh, Mayor Ed Koch, uh, where the public became very upset at seeing 
apparently mentally ill homeless people on the streets, urinating, defecating on the streets, you know, making themselves disruptive, and then blamed civil libertarians, you're responsible for this. And to add insult to injury, when uh, we, would, we then brought a class action against hospitals in New York, which were not admitting mentally ill people, homeless, poor people, who were seeking a treatment and assistance, the hospitals wouldn't admit them. So it was, uh, you know, and I honestly don't know what's happened. I haven't followed the issue since then, but uh, the, the dumping onto the street was not the, the solution that the ACLU had sought. Uh, and uh, I had another, another thought about um, some recent example, but it's floated out of my mind, so maybe that's some spirit telling me I've talked enough. But you have, you have a point, and I'll let you. The situation in California was partly this, that, that they built these halfway houses. Of course, mm -hmm. that's just construction, so that's easy to do. Right, it's it the services and the support. There's nothing mental there except mm -hmm. measurement. Mm -hmm. Well, those places were not staffed. Mm -hmm. There were not people ready to staff those mm -hmm. places. You know? mm -hmm. It's like going to war without an army. Same right. thing, only worse, maybe. Right. And uh, so that's, uh, and, and it became national. Yeah. And uh, these people were on the streets, you know, freezing to death. Oh, this, or you're, you're bringing, this is what I was thinking of, because I was thinking of some recent examples we had in California, though, where not because the, of a lawsuit, but where hospitals have been releasing mentally ill, poor people and dumping them on Skid Row, in, so called, in Los Angeles, including people with physical disabilities. I mean, the most awful example I saw was, you know, a man who was a quadriplegic with some mental disability who was just thrown out onto the street uh, without a wheelchair in his hospital gown. Uh, so these problems are still ongoing and it's, it's you know, it's, it's much easier to get somebody's freedom in a negative sense than it is to get affirmative services. And that's, I think it's part of our whole legal system and, and legal culture. And yeah, we still have those challenges too. Thank you for, for reminding us of them. I want to end on a positive note. <laughs> You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. <laughs>